Adam Smith, the father of economics, the father of capitalism, one of the greatest philosophers to have ever lived, most famous for his two main works, The Theory of Moral Sentiments and The Wealth of Nations. This is volume one of the most important work of economics ever written. The Edinburgh Festival, the greatest arts festival in the world. <laughs> As a festival, Edinburgh's unbeatable. It's incredibly exciting. Everyone shows what they're made of in Edinburgh. Anyone can have a go. I love doing it. This is the unlikely story of how the philosophies of Adam Smith manifested themselves in the Edinburgh Festival. The Edinburgh Festival Fringe, the world's biggest arts festival. In fact, there is only one other event in the world that sells more tickets, the Olympic Games. And there every four years, Edinburgh is annual. And yet, the Edinburgh Fringe is not nearly so well known. Why do people not know about it? Because it's not on the telly. Maybe if it were televised properly, it wouldn't be uh, as good as it was and you wouldn't find those weird hidden shows. And in fact, what would, if it were televised, it would just become a magnet for big telly stars who would elbow everyone else out of the way and get the coverage. When the World Cup final's on, the whole world watches on the telly. And so, the whole world knows it's on. The same goes for the Olympic 100 metres final. Everybody watches. The Fringe doesn't have one main televised event. There are thousands of different shows. So outside of the bubble of Edinburgh, few people realise just how big it is. Yeah, obviously there's the official festival, which started it all off. And you know, there's the film festival, the jazz festival, the uh, moustache festival, there's every conceivable type of drama, film, theatre, TV that you could possibly imagine. Americans, Australians, Kiwis, Canadians coming because there's nothing like it. The absolute, you know, English-speaking cultural touchstone of the world. In 2019, there were more than 60,000 performances of over 4,000 shows. Over three million tickets were sold, and there were thousands of shows that were ticketless. There are 195 different countries in the world, and there were visitors to Edinburgh from over 80% of them. Four million people came to a city whose population isn't even half a million. It's an extraordinary economic success story. And yet, nobody planned it. It happened almost by accident. My name's Dominic Frisby, and I'm a comedian from London who, perhaps unusually, also writes books about finance. And I'm trying to understand the secret behind Edinburgh's success. My theory is that it had something to do with the philosophies of a man who lived in this same city some 200 years earlier. Adam Smith, the great 18th century Scottish philosopher. His book, Wealth of Nations, is seen as the first work of modern economics, so he's been dubbed the father of economics. Because he championed what we would today call free markets, he's also been dubbed the father of capitalism. As we shall discover, perhaps he was also, in many ways, the father of the fringe. This is Panmure House in Edinburgh, where Adam Smith lived for the last 12 years of his life. And this is his front door. Caroline Howitt is the programme director. So what have we got here, Caroline? Well, here we have a first edition of The Wealth of Nations, all the way from 1776. How much is that worth? It's over £200,000 in value. An inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, thankfully abbreviated to Wealth of Nations. In terms of historical importance, um, you're looking at the economic equivalent here of the first folio of Shakespeare. Um, Smith had a vision so brilliant, so holistic, and so influential that it, it continues to influence the entire discipline of economics today. Decisions that are made all around the world, uh, even today, by policymakers owe their provenance a lot of the time to the work and the thinking of Adam Smith. 
Smith was born here, in Kikoddy, on the other side of the Firth of Forth to Edinburgh, to a customs officer, father and a mother descended from Scottish landed gentry. His father died two months before he was born, leaving him to be brought up by his widowed mother. We don't really know much about what Adam Smith looked like. He rarely, if ever, sat for portraits. He said, I am a beau in nothing but my books. This enamel medallion is one of just two likenesses taken during his lifetime. Little is known about his early life, though he's reputed to have been kidnapped by gypsies at the age of three when he was staying here at Strath Henry Castle with his uncle. When they sent out a rescue party, they found him in the arms of a gypsy woman who promptly dropped him and ran away. He would have made, I fear, a poor gypsy, said his biographer John Ray. At just 14, Smith went to Glasgow University, then situated here, around the cathedral. And from Glasgow, he won a scholarship to Oxford. He disliked Oxford intensely and left early, saying the greater part of the public professors have for these many years given up altogether even the pretense of teaching. Smith began lecturing freelance in Edinburgh and Glasgow and at the end of his lectures he would hold out a cup or a tin and people would put money in depending on how much they liked the lecture. Just like busking at the festival. He got a job at Glasgow University. And in those days, the amount a lecturer was paid was determined by the number of students that subscribed to their course. And Smith actually felt this dynamic made Scottish universities superior to English. The large endowments made to Oxford and Cambridge meant that it didn't really matter to lecturers how many students subscribed to their course. Without this performance-related pay, the quality of their teaching, Smith felt, declined. And it's thought that Smith actually wrote Theory of Moral Sentiments as a young lecturer in the 1750s with this in mind, in part as an advertisement for his course to lure in more students. It worked. The book was a tremendous success and students from all over the world enrolled. One of Smith's biggest fans was Charles Townsend, stepfather to the young Duke of Buccleuch, one of the richest men in the country. Townsend would go on to become Chancellor, instrumental in a series of acts which regulated trade with the United States and levied taxes on glass, paint, paper and tea. Americans said, well, if we're to pay these taxes, we want representation in Parliament. We all know what happened next. Townsend hired Smith to take his stepson on a two-year educational journey round Europe for the extraordinary sum of £200 per year, double what he was getting at Glasgow. And here's the amazing thing. It was a lifetime salary. How about that? For two years' work, Smith had that income for the rest of his life. Smith took the job and travelling round Europe he met with many great Enlightenment philosophers, Voltaire, Rousseau, Benjamin Franklin, but in Toulouse he began to grow bored and he wrote this letter to his friend, the philosopher, David Hume. I have begun to write a book in order to pass away the time. You may believe I have very little to do. That book would become Wealth of Nations. It took him ten years to write and he completed it here in this very room. Smith never married. He lived most of his life with his mother. And she died here in Pamuir House at the ripe old age of 92, which is extraordinary for the time. She must have been one of the oldest people in Europe. As for his character, he seems to have been the archetypical absent-minded professor. He had a smile of inexpressible benignity, according to his friend Dougald Stewart and he would often be seen wandering around, muttering and talking to himself. In fact, he preferred to dictate rather than write his books while pacing about. And apparently, he would walk up to the wall and start scratching his forehead on it to help him think. And it's thought he'd begun work on two more treaties before he died, but he instructed that all his unfinished work be destroyed. 
So here's a quick refresher on some of Adam Smith's main ideas. Now, at the time, economic thinking was dominated by the mercantilist view that you valued a nation by the amount of money it had, by the amount of gold and silver. Smith's idea was that you measured the wealth of a nation by the amount it produces in a year, what we would today call GDP. It seems obvious, but it was a revolutionary idea at the time. People should specialise. Nations and people should do what they're best at. And he used the example of pins. Why should a family make its own pins when they can go to a pin factory that makes really good pins, much better pins than the family ever could, and at a much lower price? Not having to make their own pins frees up the family to do other things. And this example has become so iconic, it now features there on the old £20 note just behind Adam Smith's face. Smith was a keen wine drinker, and he argued that it was ridiculous for the Scots to try and make wine when the French did it so well. Trade benefits both sides. The Scots benefit from the French wine, and the French benefit from the Scots' money. Restrictions on trade, therefore, inevitably make both sides poorer. Hmm, parfait. Markets are efficient. If there's too much of something, the price of that thing will fall, and people will be incentivised to make less of that thing. If there isn't enough of something, its price will rise, and producers will be incentivised to make more of that thing. This happens quite naturally, and legislators think too much of themselves when they think their interventions create a better outcome than the market. He had this to say about the legislator. He seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. He does not consider that, in the great chessboard of human society, every single piece has a principal motion of its own, altogether different from that which the legislature might choose to impress upon it. He was damning of what today we would call central planning. If there is intervention, whether it's through taxes or tariffs or subsidies, however it occurs, markets don't function as well. And the big loser in this is the consumer, especially the poor, because they end up paying higher prices. Smith didn't think there should be no government, he wasn't an anarchist, but he felt that government's role should be limited to providing the defence of the nation, keeping order, promoting education and building infrastructure. It should keep the market economy open and free and not act in ways that distort it. His other key idea was that the primary motivation for everything we do is self-interest. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. In addition to self-interest, we have a sense of prudence and self-command, of morality and justice built into us. That tempers any harm we might do others. You might argue that if there are no rules, if we have only free markets and everyone's only acting out of self-interest, this will produce chaos. But Smith's idea was that counterintuitively, self-interest produces order and concord. Our self-interest actually benefits others and indeed society as a whole. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society. He is led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Laws and regulations may aim at the same results, but they can never be as consistent or as effective as human nature. We don't punish people to force them to do good, only for acts of harm, but they will do good anyway. And that, for now, is everything you need to know about Adam Smith, apart from what he said about taxes. So, the Edinburgh Festival. The year is 1947, and the world is recovering from the Second World War. And we have this chap, Rudolf Bing, an Austrian Jew who'd escaped the Nazis in 1934 and helped set up Gleinborn Opera. And he had this idea that he wanted to put on a festival to heal the wounds of war through the languages of the arts. And he looked at various cities across the UK and Europe, and when he looked at Edinburgh, he was advised that the locals were too dour, too niggardly, and too suspicious of the morality of artists. 
Nevertheless, he settled on Edinburgh, raised £30,000, £10,000 from his friend Lord Rosebery, who'd won the money on a horse, and the rest in subsidy. And so did the first Edinburgh International Festival begin. And much of the great and the good of Scottish society helped out. In particular, this chap, Sir John Faulkner, the Lord Provost, looking every inch the man of the people. And in the first programme, Faulkner said, We wish to provide the world with the highest and purest ideals of art in its many and varied forms. And here's the very first poster. Wonderful acts. The Vienna Philharmonic, the Halle, Gleinborn Opera, Sadler's Wells Ballet, the Old Vic Theatre Company. Pretty highbrow, elitist stuff. And the festival attracted a lot of publicity. It made the front cover of the Radio Times, and the BBC would broadcast some of the events, the Orchestre Colonne and two Glyndebourne shows, Bing getting his own stuff on. And here we see Bruno Walter, the great Austrian conductor, conducting the Vienna Philharmonic. And another of the great traditions of Edinburgh was established, that there should be more people on the stage than there are in the audience. Six people in the audience there. Walter established another tradition, Ask anyone in Edinburgh how their show's going, and they'll go, oh, it's brilliant, it's amazing. So when somebody asked Walter how his show was going, he replied, here, human relations have been renewed. All six of them. At the time, there was a lot of enterprise and zeal in Scottish grassroots theatre. I'm reluctant to use the word amateur. When we hear the word amateur, we assume that somebody's not very good at something. Amateur derives from the word amare, to love, people doing things for the love of it. And often, when you do something for the love, you're the best. And there was one such theatre, the Glasgow Unity Theatre, very left-wing socialist theatre group set up to bring drama of relevance to working people. And they used to perform across Scotland and the north of England, touring around in a truck, putting on their shows in little theatres, town halls, village halls and in churches. One of their productions, A Gorble Story, was performed over 600 times, seen by over 100,000 people. It eventually got a run at the Garrick Theatre in London. And they wanted to perform, they wanted to be part of this inaugural Edinburgh Festival. There were the puppeteers, Waldo and Muriel Lanchester. They wanted to put on a morning show for kids, their underwater ballet. All in all, there were about eight groups, amateur, semi-professional, grassroots, whatever word you want to use, who all wanted to appear at the festival. But Bing said, no, you're not good enough. We're committed to the highest and purest ideals of art in its many forms. We don't want working-class theatre groups and puppeteers. And they said, screw that, we're coming anyway. And they did. And they became known as the Uninvited Eight. And unlike the big guns, they didn't get any subsidy or any help. They had to do everything off their own back. Find a space to perform in, find somewhere to stay, organise their own tech, their own publicity, their own tickets, everything. And they did so for the love of it, because they were amateurs. The Glasgow Unity Theatre and two other groups found a venue called the Little Theatre on Pleasance. The Pleasance, several decades later, would become the most sought-after venue in Edinburgh. The Christine Orr Players and the Edinburgh College of Art Theatre Group did their shows in the YMCA. It's not the YMCA any longer, it's serviced offices. Lanchester did his show in the restaurant of this cinema, the New Victoria Cinema. The Pilgrim Players did their shows at the Gateway Theatre on Leith Walk. The Gateway Theatre is now student flats with an estate agent underneath. There was one show at Dunfermline Abbey, all the way over the other side of the Forth, a highly praised production of Every Man. One reviewer said it was the best production of the festival, but so far out on the fringe. Of all the shows, perhaps the most successful was the Lanchester Marionettes. They performed to over 2,000 kids per day and counted among their audience the Princess Royal and her husband, Lord Harewood. The festival was a great success and would go ahead the following year. 
This time, Bing raised £60,000, double the £30,000 he would raised the year before. The festival didn't know what to do about these amateur groups, so it just ignored them, referring to them as festival adjuncts. But that year they grew by one. Nine amateur groups came uninvited, a 12.5% growth on the previous year. Theatre critic Robert Kemp wrote an oddly prophetic article in the Edinburgh Evening News saying, Around the fringe of official festival drama, there seems to be more private enterprise than ever before. And thus, the term fringe was coined in print. The precedent had been set. Every year, groups would turn up uninvited, putting on shows by themselves, running concurrently with the official festival. And so we move into the 1950s, and every year there were little developments, little evolutions. We celebrate the famous contribution of Oxford and Cambridge students to the Fringe. The far greater but less celebrated contribution came from Edinburgh students. They call themselves the founders of the Fringe, not quite true, but in 1951 they set up a reception centre where artists could get cheap meals and accommodation. In 1955 they set up the first central box office where you could buy tickets for any of the uninvited shows. In 1953, an entrepreneurial printer called C.J. Cosland, who loved the festival, thought to himself, if I put together a programme, I can get people to advertise and I can make a bit of money. And so do we have the first listings guide, imaginatively entitled Additional Entertainments. But look how quickly the fringe grew. Here's the programme from 1953. And here it is, from 1957. In 1958, the Fringe Society was formed. Its constitution decreed that there be no artistic vetting of the programme. And that principle remains fundamental to this day. That same year, a chap by the name of Alistair T. Moffat put on a show on his parents' garden terrace in Invergowrie, 90 minutes outside of Edinburgh. He said, there's a wonderful view of the Tay, so if the audience doesn't like the play, there's always the scenery to admire. And isn't it beautiful? But Moffat, perhaps without realising it, made a crucial point when he said that. That is, the right to fail. People just went and said, right, I'm going to do this. Not who's going to let us, who's going to stop us. It's very similar now to podcasting and YouTube, where people just go, oh, shall I wait for someone at the BBC to give me money to do this? No, i just do it. I'll film it on my phone, it'll be fine. I, I think kind of great art comes out of that. It's very punk rock. A TV commissioner or a festival director, even the imaginative ones, can't see the same potential and they can't take the same risks. They don't know what you're capable of in the same way that you do. So they book tried and tested performers, tried and tested writers, tried and tested production companies. But within 15 years, YouTube has got bigger than any television channel anywhere. It has something the Fringe had that the festival never had, the right to fail. If you go to Edinburgh one year and you um, haven't made your show work um, and you fail, uh, as it were, it may well be that that's exactly what you needed to have happen to you to, to sharpen your teeth as a, as a performer. Because it's so easy to fall back on the stuff that works and not to try new things all the time. You, you write stuff and you go, oh, no, I think that's going to be brilliant. That's, and it somehow doesn't translate to the audience. They don't, you don't take them on that little journey. I mean, they all work in the same way, jokes. I mean, I say they all work in the same way. About 90% of them don't. And was it Edison? What was his quote? I didn't have a thousand failures. It was a thousand tests before we got to this. The whole thing is about failure. Being a comedian is ultimately you failed at something else, right? By 1959, there were some 19 groups on the Fringe, performing about 35 shows between them. The Fringe was a viable alternative to the main festival. Its material was more varied. A lot of it was more contemporary than classical and so more relevant. Tickets were cheaper and productions were getting ever more ambitious. There was one by a group called the Sporran Splitters here in Braidburn Valley Park. It was called the Puddocks, which was the Frogs by Aristophanes, translated 
fray the Greek into Scots. This was the stage. And they dammed up this river to create a more realistic river Styx for the frogs to thrash about in. The actors used loud hailers and the stage was lit with burning torches. How fantastic does that sound? Shows on the main festival, however, were nothing like as experimental. Hugh Ross Williamson, one of the most influential critics of the day, complained in the Scotsman newspaper that What I would like to see is the Edinburgh Festival reassert itself by refusing, for instance, to have the Old Vic unless the Old Vic does something new. All of the festival drama this year is very dull. The most popular type of show on the fringe was the Late Night Review. In 1952, there was just one, called After the Show by the New Drama Group. In 1953, there were two more. One was See You Later with Duncan McRae and Fenella Fielding, a very saucy show, apparently. They'd approached the main festival, been turned down, came and did it anyway, and sold out the entire run. The other was the first university review, Oxford Theatre Group's Cake and Ale. The success of both meant that more came the following year. One of the attractions of these late-night reviews was that they were the only place you could get a drink after 10pm when the pub shut. And each year, the number of reviews grew to the extent that the main festival became peeved, envious even. So they decided to put on their own review. They raided the fringe for its talent, Oxford and Cambridge only, of course. Even the title was a dig. It was called Beyond the Fringe and starred four young graduates, Dudley Moore, Alan Bennett, Peter Cook and Jonathan Miller. Sir. I want you to lay down your life. Yes, sir. We need a futile gesture at this stage. <laughs> It'll raise the whole tone of the war. Born out of the competition between the Fringe and the main festival, it went on to become one of the most successful TV shows of the decade, and it had the unintended consequence of making the Fringe even more popular and desirable. God, I wish I was going to. Goodbye, sir. Or is it au revoir? No, Perkins. <laughs> In 1966, one production really caught the imagination by a young author called Tom Stoppard. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. The story is that on the first night, there was an audience of just seven. But a good review in The Observer kick-started things. And within a year, that show had been put on at the National Theatre with a cast that included Edward Petherbridge and a young Tom Baker. It became the National Theatre's first transfer to Broadway, where it won four Tony Awards, and it was described as the most important event in the British professional theatre since Harold Pinter's The Birthday Party. And that rags-to-riches story is exactly why people come to the Fringe, year in, year out. And we, in fact, got the play more or less open in this church hall, and I suppose I don't know, 20 or 30 people showed up to watch it for the first two or three evenings. And uh, we all went to the pub and all that, and it was good fun. And it wasn't until the end of the week when one of the London papers gave it a good notice that, that people came to see the play and everything changed then. But by that time I'd left. It's happened sort of every generation, someone gets discovered there. I remember Ross Noble said to me, oh, you've got to come and see these New Zealand guys. And they were in the caves, which was like, such a terrible thing. You sort of walked in there and felt like, have I got tuberculosis? I feel like I might have tuberculosis. Like, grimly damp venue. And it was uh, Flight of the Concords. Brett and Jermaine were on stage, like, just opening up the set. There was maybe seven of us. And then went the next night, and there was like, maybe 30 people, because we sort of mentioned it to a few, you know, a few, and then the next night it was like, full. And then it, by the end of the festival it was like, Oh, you couldn't get anywhere close to the caves when they play. They got me here by my apartment, right there at the bottom. <laughs> it was like that word of mouth experience and seeing something kind of grow like that. A flea bags, very interesting. Uh, to, to sort of put them side by side and to go, well, that's what can happen. When Fleabag went up to Edinburgh, I think it got like three and four star reviews. And then the BBC show, and then I saw it again in the West End when it was on last year, and you go, oh yeah, it's like a brilliant, a brilliant Edinburgh show. There's quite a lot of those that kind of people that get discovered in Edinburgh. I don't know whether it would happen without Edinburgh. Was the pub landlord born in Edinburgh? Yeah, yeah, he was a stopgap for five minutes in a show, 
um, has kept me going for 25 years. Hmm? This is a sensible, down-to-earth country. I mean, we never put a man on the moon, did we? No! No! What would be the fucking point? <laughs> he was completely born in the fringe, and uh, it, I was doing a show with, with Harry Hill, and I said, I'll compare it. And I came up with something that we did in preview that just did, just did not work. It was, it was bad. And so the opening day in Edinburgh, in the dressing room, I said to Harry, well, how about we say that the compere hasn't shown up and the barman's offered to fill in because we're in a bar? And he went, yeah, well, whatever. You know, another one of your brilliant ideas. And I went on and went, well, you know, sorry, ladies and gentlemen, the compere hasn't shown up. And I'd written down three bits then and there, and it worked. In 1974, the Fringe reached a major milestone, for in that year, it grossed more than the main festival and it has remained bigger to this day, despite all the subsidies and funding its official brother receives. By the mid-1980s, we were at 510 groups. And look at the change in revenue. 15,000 pounds gross revenues in 1974, 250,000 pounds 10 years later. It's partly a function of the inflation of the 1970s, but extraordinary growth nonetheless. The reason for its continued success can be found in Alistair Moffat's preface to the 1976 Fringe brochure. Artists come to this city to do their own thing at their own risk, with the maximum of help and the minimum of interference from this society. Any form of quality control is either by the artists themselves or their public, in a direct, immediate, one-to-one -one relationship with no middlemen, the essential quality of the Fringe is its spontaneity and complete artistic freedom, and any attempt to contain it within formal limits, either of size or quality, would be to kill its essential spirit. That is pure Adam Smith. If Adam Smith had written the preface to the 1976 Edinburgh Fringe programme, he would have written that. I think the principle of the Edinburgh Fringe that I love is that anyone can have a go, in theory. Most uh, festivals, you're invited to go, or you have to be a professional, you have to have a proper show. Whereas, you know, your mum's neighbour, who just got a funny story about a cup of tea, because if she wanted to, could go up and put on a show there now. I mean, one year we did a pub quiz in the afternoon at four o'clock, it was a fiver, and they won a frozen chicken, you know. <laughs> The actor Andrew Cruikshank was chairman of the Fringe Society. He declared, We were the living proof of one of nature's prime notions, the notion of random. The BBC and the ITV, the National Theatre, the RSC, all the subsidised theatres and the Arts Council were becoming self-regarding mafias, anxious for their security, which rested on a futile repetition of what they deemed valuable. We on the fringe were open. This was evolution and the science of the theatre in action. Why couldn't our national administration see it? A fantastically damning quote. Now, at the same time, there was another dynamic taking place. The average audience per performance was falling. In 1971, it was around 93 per performance. Fifteen years later, it had fallen by almost 40% to 55. Fewer people watched each show. Here's a production of The Spanish Tragedy in 1951 by Edinburgh students at The Fringe. There are 19 actors on that stage, all with costumes, a magnificent set, drapes, props, all sorts of regalia. If you put on a show of that size, you've got to find accommodation for 19 artists, costumes, you've got to feed them, you've got to pay them, you need set designers, technicians, it gets very expensive very quickly. Could mean you have to put your ticket prices up, but one of the lures of the fringe is cheap tickets. This wasn't just Edinburgh, it was a cross theatre in the 70s and 80s. The economics of putting on a show forced the nature of shows to evolve. As ever, the fringe was quickest to adapt, and we saw the emergence of a new type of performance, the one-man show. Michael Dale was the fringe administrator in the early 80s. He declared, The one-man show is not merely in robust health in Edinburgh. It was nurtured there. The next step was the purest, simplest, cheapest form of entertainment there is. One man and a mic. Stand-up comedy. Oh, 
Hello. You see my buttons coming towards you. Have a good night. We thanks so much for witnessing this. In 1981, Alexei Sale did his first show here. <laughs> and we had the first Perrier Award, won by the Cambridge Footlights. <laughs> now, that's a lot of nonsense, and you know. <laughs> Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie, Paul Shearer, Tony Slattery, Emma Thompson, whatever became of her, and this lady, Penny Dwyer. Few have heard of Penny Dwyer, but many of those involved say she was the driving comedic force. She decided entertainment wasn't for her and became a metallurgist. She passed away in 2003. For everyone you've ever heard of who's become famous at the Edinburgh Fringe, there's a thousand or so you've never heard of since, or that was their lot for comedy. But that first Perrier Award wasn't for the best comedy show. It was for the most outstanding review. It wasn't won by a stand-up until 1987, a Scottish accountant by the name of Arnold Brown. But since 1987, it's been won by a stand-up about 75% of the time. Since then, thousands of comedians have come to Edinburgh to cut their teeth. Think of the great names. Steve Coogan, Lee Mack, Jimmy Carr, Miranda Harp, Michael McIntyre, Dominic Frisby. I doubt there's a, there's a British comedian who didn't somewhere along the line do a show at the Edinburgh Festival. But there's one particular comedian I want to focus on, a chap called Peter Buckley Hill. You've probably never even heard of him. He does songs and odd jokes, and he's a proper amateur. He loves it. Oh, I'm 58, I'm overweight. My liver is in a hell of a state. For 20 years I've been celibate, but not deliberately. And he put on a show in 1993, and he lost a fortune. There were nights when nobody came, and uh, the phrase, there has to be a better way, was in my mind. And the following year, he did another show, PBH and some comedians. And what he did was he approached a pub and he said to the pub, if you give me that room at the back of your pub for nothing, I'll get bums on seats and they will all buy your drinks. And the pub said, cool. And then he went round with his flyers and he said to audiences, come and see my show and you don't have to pay to come in. And if you don't like it, you can leave. But if you do like it, just leave some money in the bucket. And so this was the latest evolution in the fringe. The free fringe was born. I proved it worked for me. Um, it was quite difficult to show other people that it could also work for them. This was the budget I was given for a show I did as a young comedian at the Pleasance Theatre in 2003. And it was a typical budget for the time. It was a 50-seater room, I did 25 nights and tickets cost £10 each. So the most I could take if I sold every ticket for every show after the Pleasance had taken its 40% was seven and a half grand. On the other side of the coin, I had to pay for my accommodation, my subsistence, I've got to eat, my PR and advertising for my producer, for my photos and my graphic design, printing my flyers and my posters, travel costs, set and prop, my tech and flyer are wages, my brochure. Even if I sold every ticket for every show, I would still lose two and a half grand. But it's very rare that you sell every ticket for every show. I've done it. It was very hard to go to Edinburgh and not lose an absolute fortune. Did you used to lose money when you went up to Edinburgh? What do you mean, used to lose money? Everybody loses money from beginning to end. I don't know any comedian that has made masses of money on the fringe. To a fringe performer, breaking even is a profit. What's the most amount of money you ever heard of a comedian losing? I think I heard of someone losing something like £14,000. £14,000. £15,000. Fifteen grand. Twenty grand in the hole. And then they'd go back the next year and the next year and they'd build up this mountain of debt which they could never get out of. What really annoys me about the Edinburgh Fringe, not about the Fringe, about what people say about the Fringe, like all that whinging. At what point, when they worked out on their Excel spreadsheet, 
I sell every single ticket, I still lose 10 grand. How can that come as a surprise? It said it there on the Excel spreadsheet. How can you whinge about that? It's your choice to run it like that or cut down the overheads. And if that doesn't work out in year one, it'll definitely work out in year three. No one wants to hear it. One comedian I know, a friend of mine, lost over 20 grand that year. Now that is an extraordinary amount of money for a young comedian to lose. But that was the economic reality of doing shows at the big venues at that time. And what's more, if audiences are paying 10 or 15 pounds to get into a show, the comedian feels obliged to make sure they're entertained. And so he stops taking risks and he's less experimental. And as a result, he's less interesting. However, in 2004, Peter Buckley Hill's model became official and the free fringe began. And it was immediately popular because so many of these costs were slashed. Straight away, you don't lose 40% to the venue. You didn't have a producer cost. You did your own flyers. It's great for people who don't have any money at all and have been able to do it for free, perform for a month for free and make money. I know loads of comics that were making like a thousand pounds a week doing the free fringe. Acts could try experimental stuff, they could fail. And audiences loved it because they could come and see acts taking risks. Some worked, others didn't. But Edinburgh would not be Edinburgh unless you have, at some point in your time here, seen the worst show you've ever seen in your life. I saw some people do a sketch show once that I walked out of. I always bought a ticket to all the shows, like, because you could get in free with fast, but I always bought tickets to shows. And I saw it, and it was about 25 minutes in, and I just thought, oh, this is so boring. I'm, I'm going to go and have a cup of coffee. I'm, I'm off. Well, there is every year, in it. You think you have got that thing where you think, oh, let's be open-minded. And every year you bloody regret it? Oh, how bad can it be? Atrocious! You went to see one called the Big Roland. Now, Fat Roland, he called himself. Fat Roland, now, I like, and he was a northerner. Now, I like northerners, I like fat. So I think, that should be good. And then you go in there, was diabolical. And what's the worst? Well, it's usually anything with students in, isn't it? The worst Edinburgh show I've ever seen was probably when I was in, um, <laughs> which is the student review we did in 1989. That, that at the time, we thought we were really, we were really onto something. And on reflection, it was dreck. But, but, you know, you have, you have to be allowed to fail, don't you? And other impresarios were soon copying and adapting Peter's model. It reignited the fringe. And big-name acts actually began abandoning the big venues to come and do shows on the fringe. Some of them won awards. The market had had a major problem, and the market found a solution in the form of Peter Buckley Hill. We have saved the fringe. Think of what would have happened. More and more performers would realise that they could not do the fringe without a substantial loss, and they would gradually have stopped coming. The free fringe has kind of taken over. It feels like it's got the vibe that the fringe used to have 20 years ago. Another perennial issue at Edinburgh is the problem of space. All the big acts get the best rooms. And so you end up with shows in the weirdest of places. All sorts of different venues have been tried out. There was one in the Novotel swimming pool, another in the toilets of a shopping centre, another on the top deck of a bus. I went to have a bath yesterday in my flat in Edinburgh, and I got in the bath, and a Belgian mime artist plopped out the tap. And it transpires that my bathroom is venue number 42. <laughs> he was bloody good, actually, this my mate. It's, it's a bit cramped, what with the Scotsman reviewer in there as well, but... Uh... My favourite was Alfie Joey in 2003. He did his show on the back seat of his Ford Escort. It was called Alfie Joey's Mini Cabaret, and it sold out the entire run. In 2003, the Fringe sold more than a million tickets for the first time. By 2008, there were more comedy shows than theatre. By 2014, it sold over two million tickets. In the 1970s, the Fringe had changed its dates to coincide with the school holidays. In 2015, irony of ironies, the wheel came full circle. The Edinburgh International Festival changed its dates to coincide with the Fringe. And as the festival director, Fergus Linehan, put it, capitalise on the electricity of the Fringe. 
Now, the main festival is after the Fringes audience. If I've made out that everyone is lovely and nobody ever does anything bad in a free market environment, I may have misled you. Shenanigans can and do happen. In 2008, the four main venues, the Gilded Balloon, the Pleasance, the Assembly and the Underbelly, decided they were going to try and break away from the fringe and form their own little cartel, the Edinburgh Comedy Festival. However, Smith predicted this as well. People of the same trade seldom meet together even for merriment and diversion. But the conversation ends in a conspiracy against the public, or in some contrivance, to raise prices. Rumbled. I mean, it seems very sensible to me that those, certainly those three bodies, which could have been in competition with each other, the Gilded Balloon and Pleasance and Assembly, should have all formed, should have all come together and formed a monopoly on places to perform in Edinburgh. That would have been a very sensible thing to do. The little cartel. A little cartel would have, been, would have been quite wise. But then I think they did do that. I think prices were then 12 or 14 pounds for a ticket for an hour. And people went, ah, oh, the thing is though, no. Now, why does a performer come to Edinburgh? Is it to help the homeless? Is it to feed the starving in Africa? Or to fight climate change? There are four reasons why a performer comes to Edinburgh. And sometimes it's several of these reasons put together. One is to get noticed. You want to win awards, you want to get nice reviews in newspapers, you want to land a TV show, you want to get booked at better gigs. Well, I sort of came because I thought I was going to be discovered. Um, but of course, it didn't happen. There is a chance that you might win uh, the Edinburgh Comedy Award, or there is a chance you might get noticed, or you might get good reviews. Two, because it's the best arts festival in the world. If you're a football player, you want to play at the World Cup. If you're an artist, you want to come and perform at the Edinburgh Festival. You come here to get better. This is the month where I'm investing in learning how to do an hour. There's, there's creative capital to be earned. The only way to get better is by being on stage, then having more experience, doing it more, and it's, it's really time behind the mic. And uh, so for that, Edinburgh is great. 30 shows, 30 hours in a row, at that early stage of your career, you sort of learn how to do a Netflix special. Three, to have fun, particularly students and so on. People come for the love of it. A lot of comedians go to Edinburgh to honestly for the sex, drugs and rock and roll. I've had, this is true, I've seen it. It's not a myth. They do go for that. It's fun. It's nice also going up to Edinburgh. You always watch Hearts when, whenever they play at home and then uh, pitch and putts are good restaurants. It's an easy, easy, relaxing month and you don't get any heat stroke. And four, to make money. Believe it or not, you can actually make money in Edinburgh. Well, there's a lot of people that make all of their money in that month. There's an awful lot of comics that you know, couldn't sell out an art centre in London, but within that month, they're huge stars. All of these things boil down to one thing, self-interest. I remember when I first went up there, I had a little uh, poem that was, uh, what I expected at the Edinburgh Festival, I'll get drunk, I'll get laid, I'll get spotted, I'll get paid. <laughs> and if you could achieve all four of those things, you'd had a very good August. If I could adapt a line from Adam Smith, it is not from the benevolence of the actor, the acrobat or the artist that we expect our entertainment, but from their regard to their own self-interest. It's that view of art, is, that's what Edinburgh is, I think. And I think comics have got a lot of that in them that kind of objectivist view of Ang Rand or whatever she's called, that idea of going, well, I'm gonna do this. Great, I'm now a comedian. Well, I think the Edinburgh Fringe is a microcosm of uh, a market-driven society. What it doesn't have, uh, such as a safety net, so the signing on bit is hard. Housing benefit, hard to get, uh, hard to come by as well. It's as free market, red in tooth and claw as it possibly could be. Will you, will you pay me once I've delivered the thing I promised you? Now, what everyone goes on about, saying, oh, what is wonderful about Edinburgh, everyone can come. Well, obviously, that means it's, it's an open festival. Anyone can come, and that means you have to make and finance your own way up there. The only alternative to that is if, essentially, the moment someone registers a, a show, they get a government grant. So, essentially, like the equivalent of being on the dole, then. Oh, I go up to, I sign on for Edinburgh and then stand in the pub, do some nonsense and some of the taxpayers to shell out five grand for that. Why? Edinburgh is a level playing field and that's the beauty of it. You can come up there with whatever you want to do and do it. 
but just don't whinge afterwards when it's gone wrong. It is your responsibility. Everything is voluntary. Nobody is forcing anyone to do anything. The most successful performers don't have 45% of their audience taken from them and redistributed to other more needy or deserving acts. There's injustice and inequality everywhere, and yet it's an accepted norm in this world. You've just got to deal with it. Adam Smith talked about specialisation. Look at the range of shows you get in Edinburgh. In 2018, there was a walking tour of Edinburgh with a street cleaner. In 2019, there was a show called Accident Avoidance Training for Cutlery Users. In 2016, they did a reading of the entire Chilcot inquiry that went on for several days. There was another show where they read out the names of all the victims of the Titanic, and every time they said one of the names, they took an ice cube and dropped it in a bucket. That was the show. There was one show where a woman had a seven-month-old baby and she just sat on the stage with her baby. The baby might have been asleep, it might have been crying, it might have been feeding, it might have been playing. There was no way of knowing, but that was the show. And best of all was a show with a guy dressed as a gorilla. He just sat on the stage dressed as a gorilla. People are queuing round the block to see this guy dressed up as a gorilla doing nothing. Insane. But like YouTube, you just don't know which stuff is going to take off. You know, like I said, I've taken my kids there and they, 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 they disappear all day with the fringe brochure. They see absolutely everything, of every stripe, of every possible uh, permutation. And it fills their heads with wonder and, uh, and fires their imaginations. And that's what it's for. This specialisation has created so much opportunity for so many different people. Every restaurant, every bar, Every sandwich sold to the girl that works in the box office. To, you know, it's like yeah. the whole industry is around that. So Edinburgh, I presume the people that make the most money are the people, yeah, selling sandwiches. And the irony is, the entertainment industry is almost all of it inherently opposed to the idea of competition and free markets. Look at the evidence. The irony of the stand-up comics existence is that it couldn't be any more entrepreneurial or, if you want, Thatcherite. The 80s, the Thatcher period, was the boom time. It's like the boom time of the new wave of stand-up, which consisted, you know, it, it, in a generalised sense, of people doing that at Margaret Thatcher, while also doing the things she wanted them to do. The success of the Edinburgh Festival lies in the fact that it so closely followed the philosophies of Adam Smith. And best of all, it did so accidentally, organically, without ever realising it was doing it. In the words of the great master himself, the natural effort of every individual to better his own condition is so powerful that it is alone and without any assistance not only capable of carrying on the society to wealth and prosperity, but of surmounting a hundred impertinent obstructions with which the folly of human laws too often encumbers its operations. And there is the Edinburgh Festival in a nutshell every individual wanting to better his lot, and the result is this incredible festival. Without the Edinburgh Fringe, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be doing what I always imagined I'd be doing, which was teaching history at a second-rate public school without a qualification. I would never have had the career that I've had without Edinburgh. It was vital to me. I think we'd be much more like vaudeville still if it wasn't for Edinburgh, because we'd still be going, I've got my 20 minutes. Comedy really needed the Edinburgh Fringe to flower into the huge, strange bush that it now is.